Okay, well, what I think this is, is a Raleigh and Nuda Collet, or, or sarsaparilla. Oh, really? Sarsaparilla, but of course I won't know. If we find a bunch more, maybe I'll actually yeah. Yeah, examine the, the root for this. Yeah. This is sarsaparilla, a Raleigh and Nuda Collet. It's a ginseng family. It's the only ginseng family except for Devil's Club in our region. And see, it's going to make this beautiful little umble flower and then it will turn into black berries and the berries are edible with a big stone and you can dry them and have a dried treat and they're medicinal and edible or you can extract the seed and then grow more plants. They got, they, this has a rhizome under the ground. See, it could very well be connected to this one. And see, yeah. here's an old, mm -hmm. here's, see, here's another piece here coming out of the ground. It's got a little mm -hmm. baby shoot. So this is probably, and they're all connected underground. So does it taste root beerish at all? It's very fragrant and taste, I wouldn't say root beerish, well, I think it's but, but it's tasty. It, it is, it has a nice flavor. So, so is that wild sarsaparilla, same thing? Wild sarsaparilla. Okay. There's several things called sarsaparilla, but this ah. is our native. And look at this, it's come all the way up here through this rotting wood. It's very mycorrhizal dependent, you can bet. It needs a lot, usually a fair amount of humus in the ground and creeps around. And so it's a great medicinal, it's an adaptogen. You know what that word means? Yeah. It helps your body adapt. If your body's out of whack, it'll help balance it. Either way, like Hawthorne is an adaptogen for the heart. If your blood pressure is too high, it will lower it. If your blood pressure is too low, it will raise it. So an adaptogen will help your body normalize from extremes. So it's a good general tonic, adaptogen, edible, and medicinal, beautiful ground cover you could have in your garden. And, uh, you know, anyway, it's really, you know, cool plant. You can write it down. Bo, did you see it? Yeah. And the name again? Sarsaparilla. It generally flowers best after a fire. There's many, many ecosystems where you'll have tons of the, of the leaves, but very few flowers. And looking at these, I don't see any budding yet. It may still be to come, but the fact that I don't see any kinds of buds, I wouldn't be surprised if there's not. A lot of these are not going to have flowers in this uh, habitat right here. But they have been doing some burning in some places, so there may be some areas where it's been burned and opened up is where I'm more likely to get flowers than in the shade. Heartleaf arnica. Arnica cordifolia, which is one I most often pick. And it's very distinctive smell. You cannot forget it once you, once you get that smell. It will make your sandwich taste funny. <laughs> funny. Uh, funny, yeah. Like kind of like, oh, kind of bitter and not very good. Unless you wash your hands a little bit. So when you're picking arnica all day long and then you go to eat your peanut butter sandwich for lunch, mm -hmm. it really tastes bad. Um, but, you know, there's the... So that's just one of the hazards of the job. So but you, you won't have arthritis in your hands at that point <laughs> because this is one of the very best medicines for stiffness, muscular aches and pains, bruises, sprains. It is the thing par excellence for sprains. And I hit my one of my fingers yesterday with a sledgehammer uh, and I was worried for, you know, so I immediately said, after I said, ouch, a few times, I ran and got a bottle of Arnica liniment and really slathered it on there and it just eased the pain and made it, you know, it made it resolve peacefully. So anytime you get a bruising action, you, if you can put the Arnica liniment on within minutes, that's better than in a half hour or an hour later because it's always good to use it after, but but the sooner you put it on, the less bruising there'll be, the less pain there'll be. It will resolve a lot less dramatically than if you didn't put it on. So it's good to have in your first aid kit. And I that's know. from the flowers. That's the flower of the, you can actually use the whole aerial pen. You can smell the, this, the yeah. oil, the yeah. smell yeah. that is, has the medicine. So it's their oil glands. Mm -hmm. Some arnica like Elatifolia doesn't have the glands on it or very few and they don't have as much scent, those don't make good medicine. There's about 12 kinds of arnica, and a few of them aren't very good. Most of them are. 
But the more of the smell and the oil glands and stickier it kind of gets, mm -hmm. and oily, that's the better the quality. Yeah, they say don't use it on broken skin because it's an external remedy. You don't drink it to, or take it like a tincture. It's an external liniment. That's why I use that term, liniment, as an external application. It is used internally in Europe in the herbal medicine, but you have to really know what you're doing because it's a low-dose botanical. In other words, it can be taken internally, but only by qualified professionals. You can all make your own medicine. I just take 100-proof vodka, pack in some flowers in a jar, pour 100-proof vodka, let it sit for two weeks or two months, and then press it out, and presto, there you go. You get one of the best medicines in the world. Mm. Okay, here's the, le here's, the, here's the song for this one. It goes, Calypso Bulbosa, you're a friend of mine. Calypso Bulbosa, cha-cha-cha all the time. Calypso Bulbosa, you're a friend of mine. Don't Calypso, give up your present Bulbosa, occupation. Cha-cha-cha <laughs> all the time. And that, you look at their faces and you say, oh, Calypso. It's having a party. It's all dressed up. It's wearing it's a headdress. Shoes on. It's yeah. it's a what's yeah. the la what's the common name? fairy it's slipper. It's a slipper. <laughs> and so, you can see it. So yeah, it's a little yeah. orchid. It's yeah. just gorgeous. I don't know any particular use for it other than the beauty. This is called fairy bells. So we have fairy oh. slippers and fairy bells I can hear living you. here. And yes, white fairy bells upon a slender stalk. It's the, uh, what's, uh, it is the fairy slippers decorate my garden walk. What are the uses of this? You can eat the berries. It has these rough orange berries that will have sort of a rough looking appearance, kind of soft. And, and you can eat those and they're, they're reasonable, not a great food, but a, a trailside nibble. So it's an mm -hmm. edible fruit. And, and you you might even ch I would maybe even go to my books and confirm that you know <laughs> we should do, we should you know uh, but uh, I've eaten them in the past but They're the books here. I think the books are sort of uh, some may say you know I'd, it'd be interesting to see what the books say by the time they're finished they keep elongating they're usually about that high and somewhere in there yeah oh yeah. Oh, I can. Yeah, this is a gallium. I'm trying to. It's like, do I? Can I get a? Is it sweet red rough? Um, I don't get any smell, so I don't. It's one of the galliums. It's not gallium operine. It's a native cleavers, but since it doesn't cleave, does it have any of the medicinal properties? But uh, I don't know. The 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 non-native cleavers is very good lymphatic medicine. We don't know if this is a known, I probably is not, I don't know if it's been, ever been tested. Chances are it's never so been it's tested. Cleavers, cleavers is the lot, common name okay. for its relatives. We've seen two violets so far, a yellow violet and a purple violet. And the, all the violets are edible, the flowers and the leaves. And they're really especially high in vitamin A. And they're used in salves. And they have a cute mm -hmm. face. Mm -hmm. oh, and, yeah. you know, so you can pop them in your mouth and say, I love you, I love you not, I love you, I love them all. Because they're, 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 you know, medicinal and edible. And you can bet that there'll be a strong flower essence yeah. remedy with this, too. Well, you know what flower essences are? The Bach flower remedies were invented. Actually, it's an old, old healing technique that goes back traditionally for thousands of years. And a man named Dr. Bach... Edward Bach in England in the early 1900s developed a, a brought them into modern use. And uh -huh. you take the violets, and there's different ways of doing it, but generally you take a bunch of the flowers and float them on a bowl of water in the sunlight for a certain length of time uh -huh. to infuse or imprint the vibration oh, okay. of the flower into the water. Then you take that as a diluted tincture or like a homeopathic form of that. Huh. It's very okay. diffuse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're Perfect. only using the, you might say, the etheric blueprint or the, the etheric vibration of the plant to affect your vibratory structure. Okay. So it's a really 
esoteric kind of remedy. Some people are not, are very susceptible and helped by that. Other people tend to be, I would say that some, well, it's a little bit judgmental, but uh, some people have a more coarse vibration. They're really, you know, they're, they're not really uh, working on their vibratory vehicle too much. So it may not be as uh, useful for them. And of course, some people would say that it's just a panacea effect. You expect it's going to work, and so then you do feel better. Mm -hmm. But they have now cataloged hundreds and hundreds of different uh, uses for these flower essences. Mm. No, I ate your flower. Uh, <laughs> okay, so pine? this is this is a spruce here, right? Anybody want to? Spiny. What's our what's our great jingle? Firs are flat and friendly. Friendly pines come in pairs or more, and the the spruces are square, razor stubble. And... This is these buds have not really started to elongate, and there's a lot of spruce budworm working in the neighborhood. But if you if you actually just get the you can, at this point even, like great eat nuts. a little, but it's a little bit fiber. What I like to do is wait till they expand about maybe oh, a half inch in length or even an inch in some places. And it's, it's still really young foliage. Just pull that young foliage off. It's a very pleasant nibble, slightly turpentine-ish. This, this thing out here? Yeah, but uh, I wait till it ex I expands. I generally don't eat it at this stage. And you can make a tea from the needles. No, Spruce tea is a well-known medicinal tea as well. And so you have a medicine and a trailside nibble. Yep, and it makes a handful this, to a cup is usually the thing, right? Yeah, something like yeah. You, know, you can make it stronger or lesser strong. You know, add to taste, you might say. Well, there's a lot of strawberries in here. That's a strawberry. Ah. So we have, and of course, strawberry isn't edible. Is or isn't. Is. Oh yeah, we eat strawberries all. And then the leaves are also a nice tea. Mm. So it's a it's a medicinal tea. So strawberries medicinal and edible. I love it when things are medicinal and edible. Look at that. The underside of the leaves are russeted. So this is russet buffalo berry. And it has all these dots. Glands. These are glands, these little dots. And it makes a edible berry that is uh, very, very bitter. Yeah. Have you ever eaten them? Yes. Right? Yeah. And it was one of the Indians' favorite foods. So you always wondered, how could one of the Indians' favorite foods taste that bad? <laughs> <laughs> and here's the trick. You have to pick the berries and crush the juice out relatively gently and discard the pulp and the seeds. And then you sweeten the juice to taste and you have an incredibly yummy uh, juice, which you can use to flavor things. So it's a, it's a medicinal fruit. Um, we could, I'm sure we could come up with uh, the medicinal uses for it. They can get, of course, very huge with very big, we'll look for some of them, really big candelabra heads. Here's one of the best ways you can use this. This is small, like a candle. You dip this is an old Middle Ages recipe. You take your big mullein stalk, the big ones, not the little guy, and you dip it in pig suet or fat, and then pull it out and maybe dip it several times. Now you've got something covered with, then you light, the t and you use this for pagan ceremonies. But, <laughs> and today we've substituted paraffin wax. The more time you dip it in the paraffin wax, the more times you dip it and the more wax you get on, the faster and brighter it burns. And so you can march around with these giant burning torches, just, you know, they're great at night, in the winter, really bad during fire season. Because uh, you're dripping hot wax and fire all over the place. But uh, you have to be a little careful. But uh, don't do it in the house. But uh, I've seen people where they dip them lightly and then they burn for a long time slower where they put them outside their little booths oh. as, as night lights or candles <coughs> in the landscape. So you can actually use them for a landscaping effect. Okay. It's medicinal leaves. You wouldn't use it. One of the things I've noticed about mullein, you'll probably notice if you look closely, it's very hairy. Mm -hmm. And so as a result, if it's alongside a roadside that has dust, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. they just get covered in dust. It's impossible to get off. Mm -hmm. But uh, the leaves are for lung opening. Oh. So people with asthma, mm -hmm. 
use this sometimes instead of an inhaler. They just have a cigarette with mullen, sometimes maybe cold foot or a few other ingredients, and you take out just a couple puffs in an asthma attack and it opens and helps open up oh. the bronchial tubes so they can breathe better. So it's, it seems counterintuitive to, to smoke a little bit when you're having a, 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 a attack like that, but people do use it. Or they can also take an extract. And the flowers, the yellow flowers, you pull those yellow flowers out and you put it in olive oil or some oil and you make it ear oil, earache oil. It's one of the oh. most common yeah. uses for earache you'll oh. see is that mullein flower oil, oftentimes infused with garlic and there's a couple other things. Just but drop it in your ear? And you just drop the oil in your ear. Uh, yeah, you might warm it up a little bit. So warm up that mm, little I bit of ear oil. Up. And so that's an ear remedy. And the root is a medicinal too, of course, the nice live root when it's growing. So we got three medicines and torches and what stick? Is it a fire stick? It's the hand, hand drill. Hand drill. Oh. Anybody? Here's the Latin on it. Achillea millifolium. Is it? Yeah, so or, or a thousand leaf yarrow. You know, you know, yarrow, so. Oh, it's a yarrow. Oh, yeah, it's uses right. of yarrow, it's, it's oh. nature's styptic, or it stops bleeding. So uh, you can use this as a first aid remedy in the woods. Just rub the, you know, usually you make a spit poultice, chew it up, get it really juicy, put it on the bleeding. But a good thing in your medicine cabinet is, is yarrow oil. The essential oil of yarrow is bright blue and will stop bleeding, even bad bleeding, boom, right in its tracks. It is just maybe, you know, I don't know if they have anything, in the me they may have something in the medical field as good as yarrow oil, but as a natural substance, it's maybe the best thing for stopping bleeding. So I like Of all the herbs we have here, it is probably the most all-round useful, has the most uses of anything we have mm -hmm. in our native ecosystem. So yarrow is one of our preeminent medicinal plants. I mainly use it for lung kind of stuff, colds, as a tea. But that essential oil is useful. There's a many, many uses. So if we go, we'll find a list. It helps break fevers, for instance. The flower is what you get the essential oil out of. The flower and the leaf are both medicinal, but the flower usually has stronger properties. And the best time to harvest the yarrow flower is early when it just starting to open up. And you can look at it and you'll see all these bright yellow stamens sticking out of it. That's, you want to get it early if, if possible. Maybe we'll find some, we can dig up, there's an, there's pink roots that come out of it, runners, that is an herbal novocaine. You can use it as like, a, like if you're in the trail and you get a toothache, you can chew on that and it will numb the mouth parts. But eyesight and, and, uh, and diabetes, actually, is one of the big reasons that people take huckleberry is diabetes. Yeah, so this is, we could probably say that all the huckleberries can be used, but that this huckleberry is the one that's the most famous, if this is the vac vaccinium myrtilus. What's the main food source of a lot of the Indians and their berries? Huckleberries are probably the main berry that the Indians ate hereabouts. This is a creeping runner root plant and so all under here there's a network of runners some places more than others and uh, and so if I pull part of it off or pull part of it off wherever it breaks off it's going to regrow. So I harvest this every year. Uh, this is Pip Sisawa or Prince's Pine. Mm -hmm. Prince's Pine or Pipsisawa. And it's the Ericaceae family. <coughs> Same with Kinnikinick and Huckleberries in that family. Mm -hmm. And this is a great, this is a medicinal uh, for the kidneys generally. Urinary mm -hmm. tract infections, kidney things. So urinary, I'd say urinary tract medicine. And there's a fair amount in the trade. Chemophila umbulata. It has these little dry seed capsules with this finest little seeds, just dust-like. I, you know, sometimes I've harvested bags of the seed. It's, in, it's one of the must be one of the smallest seeds I think that I've seen. 
and you can the the medicinal part is just the young I would pull that off before I shipped it this is what I would ship them and and so it's just the upper part in some cases but some customers want it with the rhizome so you pull on it a piece of it and it, it will break off somewhere below ground and you ship them this whole part here and this is also used in root beer also it's one of the traditional herbs used in root beer and so it's got a really kind of flavor so you can chew on it and get a little juice out of it it's not particularly pleasant but it's not <laughs> really that knock yeah so you can use the whole aerial plant or this or including the root for the medicine they're both good um, and so kimafa umbelata what else anyway you can see it grows in the understory and it loves deeper forest so at one point there was probably they logged this forest quite a bit and so the Pipsissawa doesn't like the thinning, so the Pipsissawa probably went down in abundance and the Arnica may have went up in abundance. The, a lot more of the shrub layers went up in abundance, so the whole dynamics of the understory changed when they opened this forest up. And uh, hence there's probably less of this, and it needs mycorrhizal fungi big time. It's a, you might say, obligate mycorrhizal plant. Pretty much all the Ericaceae's are. They need a mycorrhizal fungi that helps them get their nutrients. Because you can see it doesn't got much of a root system there. You're saying, ah, where's, where's all the fine root hairs? It doesn't have fine root hairs. It, the fungus connects into it and that, in a sense, the fungus are the root hairs for the Pipsissawa. A healthy forest mm -hmm. needs fire, mm -hmm. insects and diseases. And I had a friend who was a forester mm -hmm. and he had a big forestry operation he was a famous sustainable forestry he says I don't need insects diseases or fire in my forest I do the work okay and it's uh. interesting it's a bit of hubris or pride <laughs> but in a sense he's right if you manage a forest really well nature you are the thinning person mm. if, if nature knows how to thin forest it uses insects diseases and fire but he thins the forest and keeps it at a nice, uh, the trees aren't too thick. The best time to pick an arnica flower, or almost any flower, is before it's pollinated. So this is what we call the perfect stage. And notice how it's kind of whitish in there and it's really densely packed and there's no stamens coming out yet. Mm -hmm. As this flower develops, the flower will get bigger the middle will actually get a more brownish look and you'll get a whole lot of uh, stamens mm -hmm. sticking out of the surface. So that's the perfect stage. But you can use the older ones too and the younger ones. But that's like the ideal. But look at this shrub. It's a good understory shrub. It never gets too big. And it's spirea. Betulifolia, or birch-leaved, birch leaf spirea. It's just a little baby plant, and it's not very big. And what are its uses? It's a medicine. Again, it's an astringent. So it's for one of the many astringents out here. Rose is an astringent too. So you can use rose or, or the uh, spirea, and there's lots of other ones in here too. But uh, anyway, so uh, rose is medicinal and edible. You can use the rose hips for as a food source, but then mostly you, uh, uh, yeah, as a food and a medicine, usually the rose hip. But the flowering tips are medicinal too. Michael Moore has a famous quote in his medicinal books that goes, Another rose, another simple rose family, astringent. Okay. So it's, it's very common for the rose family to throw astringent. But look at there, we got some stamens sticking mm -hmm. up on the outer ring. Mm -hmm. And then over time, they will move into the middle mm -hmm. and the flower gets bigger and bigger until finally all of them have opened up and been pollinated and then the petals droop. 
Nicknicks is just starting to flower. See the little, little pink urns? They have, it looks like little urns. And that's, you know, another, another, you know, Eric Casey. And, of course, it's a great medicine, right? And we know it's a smoking mixture. Everybody thinks, oh yeah, we smoke it. But, um, but the, uh, I sell a lot of this as a medicine. It's like the Pipsisawa, only stronger. It's a lot of tannins. Here's an idea of the strength. Of, um, my friend Russ Willis runs Bighorn Botanicals. He said, one of his friends came to him and said, oh, I have this horrible urinary tract infection. It really hurts. Oh, what can I do? And he, So Russ grabbed a handful of, of Pipsisawa and a handful of Kinnikinick and said, here, take this Kinnikinick for two days as a tea and then switch to the Pipsisawa because you don't want to take the Kinnikinick for too long because it's so harsh mm. uh, an action. So you take that kip, pip, the Kinnikinick to really hit the uh, urinary tract organism in, in the you know in the nose and then to <clears throat> and then to continue follow up the treatment use the Pipsisawa. Mm. It's less strong but still effective so it's good to know that they're both useful for urinary tract um and the food the food values you know anybody ever yeah. eaten knick berries knick berries they're when they're red they're ripe they're really tasty they're mealy and dry and have a hard stone but it's actually not a bad food and here's a way to get the food out of it more easily I found that if you dry the berries, then you run it through a grain mill, like a Corona grain mill, with a wide setting, the stones will pass through without getting ground up, and then all the dried pulp and skin, it powders off of it, and then you sieve out the seeds, and you can sell the seeds, and then you have the powder of the berries, and you can use that as a food, and it's, you, know, you can mix it in things. So I found that Kinnikinick berry powder is a edible. It's the leaves and the and actually okay. the bark because you're you're cutting the twiggy ends off just that year's growth. I do it late in the fall when the red berries are are ripe preferably that's when I like to harvest it. So you have all that year's new growth to harvest. You're only harvesting usually one year growth um, or maybe two year at the most. So you're not way back here in this old stem, you're just at the new, new stem. So it's usually just an ingredient rather than a sole mm. smoking mixture mm. thing. So there's a lot of things that we can use. Yarrow leaves are used in smoking mixtures too. Um, uh, ocean root, there's, you know, there's lots of things. Why did the Indians smoke these things? I mean, they, so they had to get something out of it. It was like, oh, we don't have anything to do. We'll just sit around and smoke. They were smoking for some particular reason. And, you know, there was praying. Sometimes it was for praying, you know, in the peace place. But if they were doing it as a recreational use, I remember that in the California tribes, when I was reading an ethnobotany, they said, oh, the guys all have gone to the guys' place. They all go to the sauna, the men's sauna. They hang out there and they smoke tobacco until they can't walk anymore. The last, you know, and then they sleep in the sauna. That's like the men's bunkhouse, all the men, visiting men from other tribes. They would sleep in the, in the sauna, but they would smoke out. They would do a smoke out with their heavy tobacco. Oh. This is an edible, if it tastes good. Let's see. Yeah. See, here's another one here. This is what's called a pleasant trailside nibble. But it's better to wait until they get a little bit bigger. I mean, you know, I have to take, but if you take just a little leaf, uh, you know, part of the leaf of one, for instance, you could try to take, it's a licorice flavored uh, called sweet Sicily. So this is sweet Sicily, Osmoriza chiloensis. This is uh, Smilacina racimosa, or now it's Myanthemum racimosa, or false Solomon seal. The root is used as a, root me a cough medicine. So it, has, it does have uses. It's another medicinal. And there's another kind that here, we saw some back there, I'm pretty sure were the star flowered Solomon seal. 
because they're quite a bit shorter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But they are a smaller stature. But this is a this is a, the true fall Solomon seal. So the star flower Solomon seal. So there's another medicinal. It'll be a racine or a drooping white flower head, fragrant, good ground cover in a native plant garden in, a, in, a, in, the, in the city. Here's a pussy toe, which is one of the many pussy toes. Which one? We'd have to go look in the book. Antonaria. And again, it's a medicinal, another simple rose family, astringent. So it has medicinal use, but it's not used in the trade very much. And there's a couple different kinds. There's the rosy pussy toes, the low pussy toes, the tall pussy toes, the alpine pussy toes, on and on and on. There's a, there's a lot they of them. They look just like the pad of a, of a cat's foot when they open up. <laughs> look at this right here. There's a light, there's this little, a little juniper. This, this, this spade here, or this leaf, this isn't a grass leaf, this is a lily leaf. And it looks to me like it's going to be the cat's ear lily. Anybody know uh, oh, Calicortis here? Oh. oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The mariposa. Mariposa, one of the mariposa lilies. I think it's called the white flowered one, probably going to be the cat's ear mariposa. And it has edible roots. So the Indians ate the, the on the, on the, on the, on the cat's ear lilies, they that it, it, and so you can also eat the flower. It's a I don't like to, I don't really eat the leaves, but if there's a lot of the flowers, they're pretty and they can also eat them. So there's another edible out of out of that. <laughs> What's the medicines on juniper? Anybody got a medicinal Gin? use for juniper? Gin. Well, yeah, I mean the berries are. <laughs> Yeah. But yeah, but why would you drink gin? The why? The Killer berry has a particular... Oh, you actually don't want to use, drink enough gin to give you the effect. But it's a, it's again a urinary tract medicine huh. and anti-parasitic. So um, it's a, the berries, the berries of the juniper and the, and the, uh, the foliage is used as a smudge by native peoples. Almost anywhere that they grow, the native peoples use it as a smudge. And here's here's the bear here's the berries. A lot of times they'll get purple as they get ripe. Some of them take two years to mature. Oh. But you can chew that. It can be used as a food in a pinch. <laughs> but yeah. you wouldn't want to eat too much because it can yeah. be cleaning you out probably. Mm -hmm. But it's a medicinal and a trailside nibble. Again, it's a breast freshener because it's kind of. Mm -hmm. And tiny, and your breath will like, oh, you smell better today, dear. <laughs> Good. It's gigantic amounts of it. Huge, you know, it's just a major roadside plant. It's native, hallelujah. And anybody venture a guess on that, on what genus is this? A Lomatium. Lomatium. I was trying to key this out, and I'm like, well, the closest I can come is Lomatium ambiguous. So it's like, it's an ambiguous character and it may change forms. And almost all the Lomatiums are edible leaves. So it's like, well, I'll try a little bit and say, kind of celery-ish. Now, a little can't hurt you. Um, if anybody wants to sample a little bit. And I oftentimes eat the flowers, um, many of the Lomatiums too. And, the flowers sometimes may be better than the leaf. Well, the, the umbel shape, the, the, the leaf form, the way it grows, it just speaks lomation. It's the dill family, the carrot family, is the umbelifera, and yeah, swale biscuit rich, probably the best common name. And so it'll have a bulb down here. I haven't dug down to see, but almost for sure it's got a bulb. You can see it goes quite a ways down. But I bet that bulb is tasty, and, and you know, so the, it was a, obviously would be a major food source if it's a tasty bulb, which I have yet to determine. But I'm most likely it is. So this is a, a food plant. 